Um, so I'd like to start by introducing myself. I know some of you here, but not, not everyone. Um, my name's Judy De Winter, and I'm a patient governor at the Royal Free London NHS Foundation Trust, and I'm also the lead governor. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all here this evening to our Medicine for Members event. Some of you um, are members and will know about these events, and some of you are not. Um, and I just want to sort of tell you very briefly um, what, what tonight is about. Medicine for Members events are for our members, which I will tell you a bit more about in a moment. And we pick topics that um, our members, service users, carers, patients, um, tell us that they're interested to hear more about. So typically clinical areas of work, but not necessarily. So you'd see on our website that we've had all sorts of um, topics covered from massage therapy to the Ebola infectious disease unit, which is obviously very well known here now. Um, and we are always open to suggestions if there's an area of work that you would like to hear more about. Um, as a membership event, um, for those of you that don't know what membership is, um, you have the, op the option of becoming a member staff or automatically members of the trust. Um, and we um, offer membership to members of the public and patients and service users. Um, it's free, anyone can sign up, anyone 16 years or over. Um, and by becoming a member, it enables you to become a bit more engaged with the trust. Um, it allows you to, you'll be invited to certain events, um, you may be invited to focus groups, and you get the opportunity to have a bit more of a say um, as far as how some of the services at the Royal Free are designed and developed going forward. Um, as a member, you can stand for election as a governor and you can vote uh, to elect governors in your constituency. So staff will elect staff governors, patients will elect patient governors and so on. Um, if you're not already signed up as a member and you would like to be, then uh, Matt, by the door there, um, there are forms and it's also very easy to do so online. So please do so before you leave. Um, tonight, we've got a number of our governors here. This is a governor-led event. Um, we recently had elections and we elected two, uh, sorry, we elected 12 um, governors, new governors, um, to our council of governors. Um, governors are wearing badges with their names on um, and if there's time afterwards, if you'd like to, to meet one of our governors, I know that they would like to meet you. Um, it's very important to us to engage with our members and the public in order to make sure that we are representing you um, adequately and that your views are being heard. That is our core, core role. Um, so tonight, uh, this Medicine for Members event, as you know, is about ME. I'd like to welcome the charity Action for ME who are here this evening. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, Professor Stephen Holgate, who is somewhere here in the room. Thank you. Um, he's a professor of immunopharmacology um, at the University of Southampton, and he'll be speaking about developments in research. Um, I'm personally looking forward to learning more about um, services, support, and advice that's offered to ME patients, um, both now and obviously what's being planned for the future. Um, in order to improve the lives of those living this, with this really devastating condition. Um, you're also going to hear from the clinical lead here at the Royal Free, Gabrielle Murphy. Um, and then after that, there's going to be um, a Q&A panel. And, and I would ask that if you do have questions um, at the end or during any of the talks that you hear tonight, please hold your questions until the end because we want to have a really focused session. We've allocated time to have a really focused session at the end where questions can be answered. If you have a question that you would prefer not to ask out loud in an open forum, you can write it down. And again, Matt's got uh, the facilities for you to be able to do that, papers and paper and pens. Um, and we'll make sure that they're handed to the panel so that they are uh, covered. And we'll do our best to make sure that every question is answered or any comments are responded to. Um, at the end of the talks, um, please do complete the evaluation form. It's really important to us to learn going forward uh, what works and what doesn't work. Um, so please do take the time to do that. We'd really appreciate that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Claire Ogden from Action for ME, who is our first speaker, and I will be back to speak to you later. Thank you. Um, I just would like to say thank you to all of you, to all the governors and to Judy for having us here to speak about ME at this event. Um, 
I am going to stick to the timetable, so I've got about half an hour to talk to you. Um, and as part of that, I'm going to show you a short clip from a really fantastic documentary um, made by someone with ME. Um, you might have heard about it already. It's been reported on quite widely in the media, and Jen, who made the film, has been here giving interviews. Um, so I'm going to show you about the first 10 minutes of that film. Um, before that, I just need to start with an apology. You were supposed to be getting our chief executive, Sonia, who is extremely ill. I had to send her home, um, even though she didn't want to go, but she didn't want to bring germs into a hospital, so um, I am here instead. Um, so um, I, I'm just going to flip off from this screen now and go to the unrest clip. I really wish I could show you more of that film because it's really amazing, but that just gives you a flavour of, of what, it's, what it's like to have ME and the fact that um, Jen, you know, thinks she had a rare disease, she had all sorts of tests and nobody could tell her what was wrong with her. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the ignorance, injustice and neglect experienced by people with ME and you know, um, a little bit about what Action for ME does to, um, to change that. So, Jen talked about all sorts of symptoms um, in, in that film. Um, there's a huge range of symptoms that are possible to have with ME, and these are just some of them, but not everyone experiences all of them. Um, I think the key one is post-exertional malaise. That is the inability to uh, recover properly after expending any amount of energy. And that can be physical energy or mental energy or emotional energy. And that's why it's so debilitating. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, slides that talk about the different sorts of impacts of ME. Um, I mean, the first one is physical. This is a quote from a report that was commissioned by the US government. Um, it's really unprecedented level of commissioning. A, a number of agencies came together to write this report, and this was their conclusion. They looked at a huge amount of evidence and compiled it all into a very detailed report. Um, one in four people with ME is severely affected. Uh, that means they are house or bed bound. Uh, many of them lie in darkened rooms. As Jen said in the film, the slightest noise can be absolutely excruciating and many of them aren't able to be touched by their loved ones. And just think about how horrible that is. Um, diagnosis is a, is a major problem. We know that misdiagnosis is, um, is frequent and GPs themselves say that diagnosing ME um, is really challenging. Um, it's in the top three most challenging illnesses to treat, um, according to a survey by Aviva. Um, there are a number of symptom management approaches for ME, but there is nothing that provides um, real benefit for a majority of people. And this is despite the illness creating high levels of functional impairment, higher than most other chronic illnesses, and that means, you know, cancer, MS, so we're talking about a really serious condition here. Um, so you would think there would be lots of research into ME, but that is also um, lacking as well. Um, Sonia co-authored a report on behalf of the CFSME Research Collaborative, of which Stephen is chair, and I'm sure he'll tell you about when he speaks in a moment, um, that showed that um, ME is, is chronically underfunded and in fact receives less than 1% uh, of active grants in the UK. So one of the things that we do is try and encourage mainstream funders to tackle ME. It's the last great medical mystery. It should be really exciting to, uh, to investigate ME. Um, the financial impact of the condition is huge. Um, the Think Tank 2020 Health uh, released a report very recently, uh, last month, and this is what they found. These are the costs that are being spent on ME, and that 3.3 billion is a minimum cost. I mean, that is a huge amount of money. Um, we know that a research published by the University of Bristol in 2011 um, f estimated lost earnings of 102 million pounds a year. And we know that most people can't work when they've got ME. Um, our survey in 2014 found that less than one in 10 adults were able to stay in full-time work. 
and um, the social care um, provision for people with ME is, isn't great either, so um, people aren't being supported to, to achieve they can with the level of function that they have. Um, our survey found that while 97% of adults with ME are eligible on paper for social care support, only 16% had had an assessment and only six were actually receiving a care package. So the emotional impact of ME is huge and this centres around the isolation of the illness. It's physically isolating because many people are too unwell to leave their house. It's socially isolating uh, because you're too unwell to see your friends um, and often you are unable to work so that means that you stay at home. But people frequently tell us that the isolation of ME comes from people not understanding what the illness means and that one of the hardest things is having to explain over and over again what the impact is and why, even though you might look okay, you're really not. Um, so ME um, in children is the uh, biggest cause of long-term school absence. And we recently surveyed, uh, surveyed families affected by ME and we found that one in five had had a safeguarding referral made against them and this is because the people making the referral often teachers don't understand the impact of ME so things that are a red flag in other situations like keeping your child home from school not letting them see their friends and um, that has to happen in ME but it it causes huge problems so part of the work we do is working with schools to educate them about the impact of ME and provide lots of resources for teachers so that they can work to support those pupils effectively. So this is one of our lovely fundraisers who uh, did the Great North Run I think, um, although that is very sunny for Newcastle. Um, our vision is a world without ME and we have been working for uh, 30 years um, to try and achieve that. Um, we support people with ME to um, access the services they need and, um, and fulfil their potential, but ultimately we're working towards a cure. So this is our strategy for 2016 to 2021. Um, we talk about improving the lives of people with ME, but also we need to take action to secure change for the future. So we provide services and support now. Um, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but we also work with policymakers and uh, decision makers to um, increase understanding uh, and awareness of ME, um, not just on the front line, but at a policy level, so we, the right sorts of services and support can be commissioned for these very vulnerable patients. And we also want to bring more people and more money and more research into the field of ME, and that's about support, having the right infrastructure so that new scientists and um, researchers who are interested in the illness feel supported to uh, to take on the challenge of investigating ME. So this is some of the services that we offer. At the bottom there is pictures of our membership magazine. There's loads of copies over there on the table and I would encourage you to take one. Uh, we provide lots of printed information still because many people with ME aren't able to use a computer and that's really important that we do that. Um, we also have peer support forums online and that helps reduce some of the isolation that I talked about. Lots of people with ME don't know anyone else with the condition and then they come to our forum and they find people who go, that happened to me too and that's a really supportive place for them to be. Uh, we have specialist welfare advice and we offer one-to-one -one information um, on our phone line and also by email. And we also have a directory of local and national services that you can search uh, using your postcode so you can find a support group near you and also your local specialist clinic. Um, about 20% of the work that we do is focused on research and I'm not going to talk too much about that because Stephen is going to talk about research but essentially uh, we want to invest in a new generation of researchers and that means supporting PhD students and also supporting the work, uh, work of the research collaborative. Um, the more scientists that we can get interested in ME, the more likely it is to, to change things. And then we also um, want to increase public awareness of ME. So to do that, we share the stories and experiences of people with ME, their voices at the heart of everything that we do. A couple of examples on there is the employment toolkit. So that is supporting people to... Uh, stay in work if they can or go return to work but also leave work well 
uh, because some people are just too ill to work. So that's people with ME that we support, but also their employers and their colleagues as well. Um, and we also uh, work with um, parliamentarians um, and uh, researchers within Parliament to, uh, to support them to support their constituents as well. Um, so I'm just going to focus in a little bit um, and talk about our Spotlight on Specialist Services report. We published this in July. Um, again, there's mag uh, copies of our magazine have an overview of this report if you want to take it with you. And what we did was we um, sent a freedom of information request to all the commissioning uh, bodies in the UK, so that's England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, uh, to see how they record data on ME prevalence, uh, how many people have got ME in their local area, and also what services they commission for those people. Um, so what we found was that less than a third of NHS organisations um, record any data on people with ME. 30, uh, that's the green bit, um, provided information on numbers of people with a, with a diagnosis, although that was the numbers that we saw were really vastly below the rate that we, ex that we expected. Um, and that suggests possible underdiagnosis, um, which we know is an issue. Um, 33 organisations provided estimates based on natural, uh, national population data, um, but there's a whole, whole load of, um, of organisations that just didn't know how many people had ME in their local area, and um, that has an impact on services. You can't commission the right level of service if you don't know how many people need that service. So 44% of CCGs and their equivalents said that they had a local specialist service. Um, so that is 103 services, 44%. Um, it sounds like a lot, but we know that it's not quite as it seems. Uh, one fifth made reference to occupational therapy or pain management services. And whilst these can be really, really helpful, they're not necessarily designed specifically for people with ME who need really specialist care. Um, and some services are being commissioned jointly. So, for example, uh, Essex Chronic Fatigue Service, um, uh, six organisations refer patients to the Essex Chronic Fatigue Service. So, even though they all said they had a specialist service, that's actually still just one service. So, uh, because that single service is, provi is providing services for such a wide area, that means people with ME have to travel quite a long way, and that can be really challenging, particularly for people who are severely affected. Um, what we also know is that some areas do not have specialist services at all. There isn't a single specialist service for people with ME in Northern Ireland. Um, and Scotland and Wales have very few services as well. So that means that people, uh, particularly those living in rural areas, they're already isolated, but um, that mean, on, on top of that, they don't have access to specialist care. Um, we also found out that um, about 45% of UK services are referring to other sources of support and listed about 25 different kinds of places that they're referring on to. Um, some of those were local support groups, which are a great source of information, but um, are not a specialist service. Um, and um, they're often led by patients who are very ill themselves. Um, about half of the, uh, the CCGs that responded said that um, what they, uh, they refer, depending on the individual circumstances of, of the patient, and uh, whilst that's great, uh, healthcare should be responsive to individual need, um, there's an issue there that having no defined clinical pathway means that um, decisions are decided solely at the level of, of the clinician, and that can lead to inconsistent treatment. Um, particularly because so many GPs tell us that they struggle to diagnose and, and treat ME. So I'm just going to say, why does this matter? There is no pharmaceutical cure for ME. So it's really, really important that people have access to the right sort of specialist care. This is a quote from uh, Sally, one of our supporters. 
She had really severe ME and she still has ME. She has not been cured by access to a specialist service, but what it's done is that it has, it's given a light at the end of the tunnel that she was stuck in for a really long time. And appropriate for Sally was um, having people come to her house um, to work with her at a level that, that was right for her. So what we would like to do is um, two things as a result of this report, and both of them are only possible if we do them with patients and clinicians. That is an ME patient there, that's Sharon, she is local to us in Bristol, um, she runs a support group uh, for people despite being really quite poorly herself. And the views and experiences of people like Sharon are going to feed into both of these pieces of work. One is about collecting data. How can we do that better? And how can we support NHS organisations to do that better? And the other one is about um, how can we develop a blueprint for appropriate services that meet the needs of people with ME. Uh, so just before I hand over to Stephen, I am going to invite you all to get in touch if you've got any questions or if there's anything that I've talked about that you think, I want to contribute to that, I have skills that can make a difference and um, you know, I, I want to be part of your movement for change. So I'm going to hand over to Stephen now, thank you very much. Well, uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Judy, thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you very much indeed, Claire, for that introduction. Um, you won't know me. Um, I sort of hover around the south coast of England, where I've been for about 40 odd years, which is very nice. Uh, I trained at Charing Cross Hospital here in London. I met my wife here in London, and uh, we spent two years at Harvard Medical School before the new medical school at Southampton was established, and I helped establish that a number of years back. So I'm a practicing clinician, uh, I'm an immunopharmacologist, which is a long word for saying that I'm just interested in how the immune system works in complex disease. And my particular area of interest is allergic diseases and respiratory illness. And it's through the allergic sort of disease interest that I started getting patients referred to me with this group of conditions, uh, which is only one of the many manifestations of it. And it I became very frustrated, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> um, as a practicing clinician, uh, as to the journey that these people who eventually ended up at my clinic uh, had gone through. And to tell you the truth, I stand in front of you now um, quite ashamed of my own profession, to be quite frank with you, uh, that the last nearly 100 years since Florence Nightingale was one of the people who had this condition and was bedridden for six years, close to where I live in West Wellow, uh, near Romsey in Hampshire. She indeed had it. And yet the progress made in terms of understanding um, what's been going on here has been um, infinitesimal until relatively recently. And in fact, we've been in denial as a medical profession about this condition, not only as practitioners across the whole piece, but research as well, and research organisations. And that is just not acceptable. And I hope when you leave here this evening that I can give you a slight glimmer of hope, even though myself I am not a practitioner or a researcher in this particular field, but I'm talking to you now as a doctor and as a scientist, and I don't think any of my friends in any other aspect of science, if they knew the facts, would s speak otherwise. So we've already heard and seen visibly in that incredible film, which you saw part of, that this is a condition that affects all age groups, including children, and causes immense suffering. And uh, we can linger on the different aspects of it, but whatever form of it you have, we're talking about large numbers here. And there won't be a single community in the UK that won't know people suffering from this condition. And in fact, it's nothing unusual um, because worldwide, as you can see, the numbers are massive. And the problem why the medical profession, particularly, and researchers more generally, have not engaged in this is because they can't understand it. 
Now that may sound extremely strange when you think when my grandfather started practicing medicine in the 1930s, he only had six drugs to be able to give people. So we can't really say that understanding mechanisms led to treatments, because at the time, of course, many treatments were being given to people on the basis of clinical trials and various other observations that doctors made. So at the present, we don't have any proper treatments for this condition other than those that support patients. I'm not apologetic about that. I'm saying that these are good things. But what we would like to have is the left-hand side looked after. If only we knew what was driving it and what we could do to try and uh, restore people to normal. We've heard of the multi-symptom manifestations of this condition, and I won't list them. You can see them all there. So this isn't just about fatigue. This is about a multi-system disorder affecting many different parts of the body. And, of course, we've heard of this linked to exertion, which I, as I will talk about later, is particularly fascinating. And it really differentiates this condition from many other conditions associated with fatigue, which is a common symptom in chronic illness. And of course it has incredible effects on the way people are able to function in life, both at work and in play and in attending school. So we've got an issue here. And I just fail to understand why our health organisation hasn't actually admitted this, because it hasn't. And I talk to people in different walks of the health service and in research, and they're still in denial. They are genuinely in denial that this doesn't really exist, and therefore why bother about it? So I think this evening, which is, I think, something like what, 62 years or, yeah, 62 years after the Royal Free illness broke out at the Eastman Dental Hospital as it was then. It was the Royal Free, of course, in those days. The sort of Royal Free disease, I seem to recall it was called. And it was labelled as hysteria at the time. And that label has stuck over these last 50 years, that this is some psychiatric or psychological abnormality. And therefore, that's why people have, in large part, from the medical side, disregarded it. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it certainly hasn't helped. So you've seen a, a sort of wordle, something like this, where we have multiple different manifestations of the condition. But the question I want to put this evening is really whether, with the movement of science, can we really now for the very first time, get a proper handle on this group of conditions. I'm calling it that because it may not be just one condition. This has slipped under the radar. It has. And if you look at any other chronic condition, you'll not see anything like the underinvestment that this condition has achieved. So I think, and I bow my head a bit, in shame over all of this because I think our medical profession genuinely needs to be honest with itself and start facing up to the facts. So we've already heard from Claire mention of this Academy report. This is the United States Academy of Medical Sciences, uh, Academy of Sciences. This is the equivalent of the Royal Society in this country, which is not a trivial institution. Notice our Royal Society and our Academy of Medical Sciences didn't do a report like this. It was the United States that did a report like this. And as you correctly pointed out, Claire, it was a group of the best people in the country that were brought together from every aspect of science that could impact on this condition. And their conclusions, you read out very clearly, was that we're dealing with a, a real illness here. And they called it beyond myalgic encephaloma, myelitis chronic fatigue syndrome. And they called it beyond because they wanted to get through this next phase, which was to try and understand the biology. They even went to the point of trying to rename it systemic exertion intolerance disease. Well, that upset quite a few patients when they were labeled with that sort of thing. So it wasn't really ever adopted. But I think it just stresses the, the importance of exercise and the fatigue that follows that. But the important thing that this group did in the United States, these very serious scientists, is they said it is not a psychiatric or psychological condition. 
And that was what patients wanted to hear, and that is what now is accepted, thank goodness. And of course, one of the things is that they, it can be diagnosed if the right questions are asked, and we can go through some of that in the question time, because Gabriella is here and she'll be able to help us with that. And we can think about using the new biology to help us come up with some new tests. So this is what they said. It is a, um, the United States report that is, is that this report is a valuable resource and you can read the rest of it there. It was a very serious statement of intent with the best scientists and clinical people in the land. And the important thing about all of this, this group of people that came together and came out with this report, is that they recognised that the condition affected different people to a different extent with different sets of symptoms. It was a highly heterogeneous condition. And we know in rheumatology, for example, or in multiple sclerosis, you know, there are very heterogeneous manifestations of those diseases. Well, this is very heterogeneous with multiple components. And in a way, that's made it, in some ways, difficult uh, to get a handle on. And you can see on the right in green, if you can read it, some of the characteristics that this group uh, in the US came up with. And this is what they said. Innovative biomedical research is urgently needed to identify risk and therapeutic targets for translational efforts. In other words, we need to understand the biology if we're going to understand how to intervene effectively. And so they suggested large-scale efforts to try and tackle this. They recognised, going back through the literature, there were lots of small studies which couldn't be repeated and there were methodological issues, problems with the recruitment of different types of people with it as well, as you'll see. And also the availability now of technology that was coming in to be able to answer some of the questions that others have not been able to do. And of course, what they really wanted to do is to say, look, what this area now needs is scientists from across these different fields, whether it's immunology, neuroscience, whether it's uh, brain imaging, whatever it happens to be, to come in with your expertise and help us sort out this complicated area. Now, Carmen Green, she was the panel chair um, a very, um, I would say, a rather unique physician in a, in a way because she was able to look at the big picture, not get tangled up in the detail. And it was a very wise choice of chairperson and she came up with some of these comments when the panel completed. And I won't read them out, you can read them for yourself, that we need more studies, we need better research, we need to understand basic mechanisms across the life, life course, that we need to bridge the knowledge gaps with more technology and reinvigorate the field with new scientists. We need to collect appropriate biological samples to be able to analyze them properly in large numbers of people and store them properly. So in about five years ago, because of my experience, I formed this collaborative that you uh, mentioned, Claire, and we tried then to, in the UK, get a group together. And I think we've made quite a lot of progress in this area in getting the Medical Research Council and the charities and the clinical people and everyone to start talking a common agenda. And I've listed that common agenda there, which I won't go through, but I'm going to give you some examples in a minute as to where we should be going, which is not dissimilar to the conclusions that the Institute of Medicine made. And you'll see here the people that are involved with this are very reputable organisations like the Medical Research Council and Arthritis Research UK, plus our wonderful charities of which Action for, FM, uh, for ME uh, is one of them uh, who helps us promote our cause. So we've made some progress, we've got the key players together, we've managed to create a central gravity to be able to start coordinating some activity. So how are we going to tackle this and what, how is the world going to deal with this? Well, the exciting challenge here is the fact that we know nothing about the cause of this group of diseases. A lot of us have got some idea what may be causing it, but we do not know what's driving it. And 
in parallel with that ignorance is this very exciting journey that medical research is going on now called personalized medicine. I don't like that. I would prefer stratified medicine or even a better term, precision medicine. In other words, trying to use technology to start with the patient and work outwards rather than pretending you think you know what's causing and working inwards. And so this will identify new diseases, this approach, and will come up with new descriptors of disease or taxonomy as it's called. And chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, lends itself beautifully to this approach because we haven't a clue what's causing it, so we may as well start here and start with the patient, which is absolutely excellent. And this journey, which most of complex disease is now on, including cancer and arthritis and diabetes and asthma and COPD and osteoporosis, and we can go on and on and on. We're all going down this journey. This is a matter of getting together a group of interdisciplinary scientists who can communicate their skills in a common cause cross-disciplinary, interdiscipline, call it what you want. But anyway, skills from different parts of the community. And these skills will be using a bridge between biology and what we call the physical sciences, mathematics, to be able to use technology to capture the complexity of a disease like chronic fatigue syndrome in mathematical terms. That may sound fanciful and strange, but once you've actually got mathematics and ways of being able to describe something mathematically, then you can construct causative mechanistic links. So this is what Leroy Hood uh, said in the United States. He's one of the people who initiated all this P4 medicine, as it's called, predictive, preventive, personalized and participatory, stratified medicine, personalized medicine. In addition to being able to uncover diseases we knew nothing about, what's interesting about this approach, it can tell us about illness and wellness. And we all know people who have got cancer or rheumatoid arthritis who carry on their lives remarkably. And we know others with exactly the same disease who are completely destroyed by it. So this whole understanding of what makes a person ill and what makes a person well is about how you function in society. And it was very interesting that this scientist, the systems medicine person, uh, came up with that as the potential of this wonderful approach. And what this approach is all about is obtaining information in different layers, starting with the gene and working all the way down through the proteins, through the chemistry, and then through the symptoms that the patient may express. All those different layers and capturing information at every layer. So any one patient could have all this information captured in one place. And this enables these mathematical networks that I was talking about i.e. what are the driving principles of this person's particular problems linked to at these different levels. The key to this, and this to me as a doctor is the most exciting bit, the key to this isn't animal models or the pharmaceutical industry or some computational um, experiment going on in some physics laboratory, it's about the patient. Because without the patient, we don't have any material and have nothing to be able to mine. So you'll see in that diagram there, with all these different technologies all around it, the patient is at the center. And that's what makes this journey we're about to embark on a really exciting journey. Because for the first time, the person like you saw on that film is going to be the center of where all this biology is going to emerge from, which is absolutely superb. Right. So why is it now that we've got this opportunity? Well, it all comes to understanding that every single human being, indeed every single animal out there or plant out there, is living in their own environment with their own factors that are programming them across a whole life course. And you heard that young lady uh, explain that she had some viral illness or some illness, and then suddenly that was the end of it for her. And that was the, obviously, her story. But you'll hear it from others who, Olympic champions who overtrain and suddenly they 
just can't do it anymore and they have four years. And there were various different stresses that come along that trigger this. And what we've got to do is to look at all those different things around the edge of that, which is, you know, maybe the diet, maybe exercise, whatever, and come up with chemical and cellular causative pathways that that particular virus, when it came in, caused that problem and stimulated these events. And this is really where this omics technology comes in. This is where this layered effect, starting at the genes and ending up with the symptoms and signs. And that by putting together all of that in a single construct, not separately, the information in there is so incredible and precise that you can identify ca causative pathways. And you, you, individual patients, individual human beings, because the data content is so high, are very, very informative when you're doing this sort of approach. Whereas when we normally do medicine, we take blood pressure or whatever it is, half a dozen things to go off. Here you have hundreds and thousands and millions of things within a single individual to be able to go off. That's what all this is about. And we couldn't possibly do it unless there was a way of integrating the data. So I chair one of the um, important uh, analytical platforms at Imperial College called the National Phenome Center. This is just one of those layers that measures the chemicals that the body makes under different conditions. And this just shows the equipment that they have to measure this in blood or in urine. Uh, this shows in the second panel the sort of information you can get. You can measure maybe 10 or 15,000 chemicals simultaneously within a single sample. And then, of course, putting it together with this mathematical approach I talked about leads to the pathways that I was uh, talking about. That just gives one, that's just one level. And in the case of asthma, which is my area, in Europe, uh, we've had a big grant, uh, and it just shows you the sequence of events. Notice on the left, it's the patients driving this, the sample collection, collecting the biobank, and then doing the analyses. Well, is it going to work? Well, we've only just started, we, the world, not we, Britain, the world, has only just started down this avenue. But there are several publications already in the literature, you'll see some of those, 19, uh, 2016, 2017, already beginning to come out with some really exciting, novel, uh, um, previously not understood areas. I'll just give you three examples, and we can talk about more later, but the three that excite me most of all, because it relates to what that patient was talking about. The first is that if you take plasma and you measure metabolism in plasma, metabolism of proteins or fats or sugars or any chemical that the body handles, and you look at the whole array, what's fascinating is that if you look at patients with this group of diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, compare them to controls, males and females, you can see that the uh, chronic fatigue syndromes uh, have lower levels of activity at all the metabolic levels. So the re component one versus component two is just a measure, it's called a principal component regression analysis. It's just comparing the level of activity between chronic fatigue syndrome and control of different pathways. And you'll see for both men and women that those patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, their metabolism is pushed down. Whether we're looking at fats, amino acids, proteins, whatever. They are not metabolizing as effectively as a normal person. And there's some differences between males and females. Subtle, but there's a lot of common uh, activity. The differences between male and female might account for why this is more common uh, in females than males. I'm not saying it's always more common, but often it's reported to be more common. So that's point one. So what is it telling us about the biology? Well, it's really, really fascinating. On the right here, you've got a worm called C. elegans. Okay, that's on the right hand side. I'm going to come back to the worm in a minute because it's, a, it's a, a hero in a way, this little worm. Um, these metabolites are decreased. So we have in chronic fatigue syndrome a hypo, hypo low metabolic syndrome. And th this really is telling us that for some reason these people are shutting down 
their metabolic pathways and preserving their fuel preferences for the critical parts of the body that needs to exist. And that this is triggered by adverse conditions. And this is where we come back to our worm. The same metabolic abnormality that they've detected in patients is found when the C. elegans worm goes into the state called dower, or when a hedgehog goes under the shed and hibernates for the winter. The same metabolic pathways are activated. In other words, what we've got here is a hibernation signature okay, in the metabolites of these people with chronic fatigue syndrome. And that this is about trying to preserve survival against harsh conditions. That's the reason why dower exists. But obviously in these individual human beings, the harsh conditions, in that case I think a virus infection, triggered this set of pathways. And so you'll see at the bottom there what the conclusions of this paper was. Very exciting. I mean, this is a real you know, breakthrough. And of course, what I would say to this is that, well, you know, it needs repeating. Well, it was repeated by a completely separate group on a completely different set of patients. And I've shown all the metabol metabolites along the horizontal axis here. And you'll see the chronic fatigue patients in green and the normal individuals in red there. And I don't need to go through what they are. It doesn't matter. But you can see the same picture, that the metabolic activity is decreased across the piece in this group of conditions. And this just shows that there was a lot of commonality between the two studies, and I needn't really go through that. Yeah, so this is a very interesting um, discovery. A second discovery that was published only a few weeks back, uh, a few months back, I should say, was looking at the immune system. Because often patients, as you heard this patient complain of, they have some sort of infection and something happens. So this was a study conducted in the United States where they measured in the blood the uh, signaling proteins that tell you whether your immune system is switched on or not. And this is quite a complicated area, I can tell you. I spent my life in it and I still not fully understand it. So, you know, you can take it from me that there are many, many different interactions here. But I want you to look at the blue bars here in all of these um, graphs and you'll see that in people who have chronic fatigue syndrome of short duration, and that is that the doctors got to them and took the blood shortly after the condition began, uh, and they went on then into a more chronic condition, you'll see, compared to the more established condition, that the levels of these immune proteins are higher. Different ones, it doesn't matter what they are. And that this would suggest that events are going on while this condition is taking hold where there is hyperimmune responsiveness. In other words, the body is going in overdrive to try and compensate for this. But by the time the disease becomes fully established, like you saw two years down the line in that lady on the film, then her levels are normal. So that brings us to the second important bit of all of this, is that this isn't a static condition. Some people get it, some people have it for a lifetime, some people recover. And what it is about triggering this as opposed to what makes it stay are maybe two different components and they both need to be studied and that's certainly what this subject shows and you'll see here what the overall conclusions were uh, that they believe that this uh, exciting data uh, has something to do with the severity of the, uh, of the condition. Okay. The last thing I want to say, which has just come out very recently, if actually you've gone to internet now, you'll see a lot of buzz around all of this. This is a study in Newcastle, um, where the weather I think is better actually uh, than it is down here today. Uh, and this is a very nice study by Julia Newton and her team, who asked the question, if there is a hypometabolic state, is, are the cells of the body not utilizing energy properly? Are they not able to convert things into, uh, you know, running on three cylinders rather than running on four, put it politely, in terms of a car? And using some very sophisticated technology, not dissimilar to what I've described, she was studying these mitochondria, which were the little factories in the cell that generate energy, and what she and her colleagues have showed Thomas and co-workers, is that, as you'll see in those little red squares, that chronic fatigue syndrome, which are the ones on the 
right of the square compared to normals. At all sorts of different ways of measuring it have decreased mitochondrial oxidation and metabolism. In other words, they're not converting the signals into the right energy levels that enable the cell to function normally. Whereas when they look at the energy generation outside the mitochondria, which are the green boxes there, you'll see there's no difference between the two groups, really. So what this basically is saying is that, well, you know, when somebody stresses themselves, their mitochondria can't really switch on to adapt themselves to this increased energy demand, and so the people just go down and they can't any longer function. Which, if you heard what she was saying, that lady on the film, was very similar to what we're witnessing here. And there will be causes for this, which we've yet to uh, understand. And obviously this has come out very, very recently, October the 4th, 2017. So we're talking very recent research. So those are just three examples where this new technology of being able to interrogate complex systems with the modern technological platforms is now opening up the field for the very, very first time. And the head of the um, National Institute of Health in the United States, and thank goodness Trump hasn't got rid of him yet, which is just wonderful, recognized this. And what he said, he said, right, we're going to do something about this. So what he did was to put some funding aside and he created a competition in the US between the different laboratories across the US. About 17 applications came in for three major centers and one coordinating center. And they've just announced a couple of weeks ago what these are to bring together the biological information and the clinical and physiological information so that the approaches I'm just describing to you can be done on big samples using standard ways of doing it. So that's terribly exciting. This is what he said, the uh, NIH head, and I won't read it out. They've each got seven million dollars. They can pull their resources now and start working together using these technology platforms. So what I'm going to say is what his conclusion was. These important grants will provide a strong foundation for expanding research in ME-CFS and lead to knowledge about the causes and ways to treat people affected by this mysterious, heartbreaking and debilitating disease. Francis Collins, the head of the National Institute of Health in the United States. Now, if that isn't an endorsement, I don't know what is. Canada has recently, within the last couple of weeks, come in and they're funding a centre too. So we want to be the sixth centre here in the UK. And, you know, we're going to work with the people in the US to put together our act here in the US, and I hope the collaborative will help in that, to be able to add to this incredible journey where we in the UK, using our National Health Service, can recruit patients and contribute to this. So I think from now on, royal free disease, if I could use that condition, is going to become something that will actually have some mechanistic insights put into it. Whereas previously, of course, we've always wandered around in the dark. I think the future is fantastic. I genuinely believe, I really do believe, that this is going to work. And I think we, as clinical scientists in this country, have got to be part of this journey. At least, as far as I'm concerned, it's the very least we could do uh, for our patients. Thank you very much, Claire. Good evening, and um, thank you all for coming. Um, that really says who I am. Um, but in addition, and the reason that I know Stephen is because I'm currently chair of the British Association for CFSME, which is called Back Me, and it is an organisation that is um, to support all health professionals, not only doctors, but all health professionals involved in the treatment of CFSME nationwide. Um, it includes those who live in Scotland, so we um, breach some borders there. Um, and the reason that's important, of course, is because it's about training and development and saving some of the services that are now at risk because of decreased funding. 
So what I'm really going to do, because I think Claire and Stephen have covered just about everything and left me nothing much to say except to describe uh, what a service such as ours does. Um, so it is an adult outpatient service only. I'm the clinical lead and I have a team of psychologists, uh, exercise physiologists, physiotherapists and trainees who come to learn about the illness. Um, we only see adults over the age of 18 under normal circumstances, but we do see 16 year olds if they have left secondary education and are in partial employment. Um, and that is a directive, a government directive, um, part of the national framework for paediatric services. So as an adult physician, I cannot assess children. Um, an outpatient service only because we do not have the staff to have an inpatient service and neither do we have the funding. And that again is part of the problem, is that funding for um, CFSME has been reduced um, by CCGs, by decisions made by CCGs <coughs> under what is known as a policy. Um, it used to be a procedure of limited clinical effectiveness and it is now a procedure of limited clinical value. And our current fight with CCGs, or our current interaction, I should say, with CCGs, is that it isn't actually of uh, limited clinical effectiveness. We can help patients, and it is vital that services do stay open, because if they don't, then we aren't going to be able to recruit the patients that Stephen needs for his research. And indeed, that we can't then be a research centre. And unfortunately, um, uh, that's the case nationwide. Nationwide, services are uh, closing all around the country. Um, it's a pity because um, in 2002, uh, the chief medical officer of the time, so Ian. Uh, Donaldson, uh, Liam Donaldson, I beg your pardon, Professor Sir Liam Donaldson, um, uh, commissioned a report. Uh, it was published in 2002, and the reason that it was commissioned was that his mailbag was actually larger than the MMR scandal at the time. And so he decided something needed to be done about it. And it's a very interesting report. It, um, it gave a number of directors, one of which is that we should call the illness CFSME. That caused some controversy and continues to cause some controversy. And even the Institute of Medicine's new name, as Stephen and um, Claire have shown you, uh, isn't actually uh, uh, a fix-all. Some people still don't like the name, although I'm a particular fan because um, neither CFS nor ME are actually precise, um, whereas the uh, Said uh, terminology, which is systemic, so it acknowledges that the illness affects all systems, exercise intolerance, and the reason that the Institute of Medicine came up with that after doing an incredibly extensive literature search was because it was the, the, the most common symptom that people complained of was exercise intolerance. And indeed, in all the other criteria, for all their faults, post-exertion malaise is the classic symptom in, in this illness. Well, yes. Um, and then they called it a disease, which also acknowledged how serious it was. So I'm a fan, but not very many other people are. So I go with the flow on that regard. Um, should we be doing anything else? I couldn't agree with Stephen more. At the moment, funding only allows us to follow what the evidence base is, and the evidence base is the NICE guideline currently. Recently, there has been an outpouring of objection to the NICE guideline being relegated to the static list, where it wouldn't be reviewed for another five or seven years. And we've managed to have that re uh, reversed with our submissions, both from the Royal Free Hospital and from, um, as chair of the uh, British Association for CFSME. Um, unfortunately, the um, outcome of that review will not be available until 2020, which is a long time, a long three years. Um, other than that, I don't have much else to say, except that um, 
We are proud that we've been able to continue as a service, having started off as the Royal Free Disease in 1955. Um, Ramsay MacDonald, who was the, um, no, that's Prime Minister, Melvin Ramsay, sorry. <laughs> Melvin Ramsay, well, he was as prominent. Um, Melvin Ramsay, who was the uh, um, uh, infectious disease lead at Coppets Wood and um, ran the first service there, um, called it benign myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, all things went quiet from 1955, 1964, when he wrote his treatise, which is well worth the read and is in the Royal Free Library, Medical School Library, if anybody so wishes to read it. Um, and then uh, yuppie flu came to the fore in about the 1980s um, and it was in 1988 that the um, first criteria, the Holmes criteria, Holmes was the man who, who was leading the group that devised the criteria from the CDC, the Center for um, Disease Control in Atlanta in America. And those criteria were reviewed and made more precise by a man called Fukuda in 1994 and those criteria the Fukuda criteria are the most common criteria used in services across Europe not only in England but across Europe um, the Oxford criteria were drawn up in 1991 so called because it what they were uh, uh, um, drawn together after a meeting in Green College Oxford and then there are the Canadian criteria as well there are also some South African criteria so everybody's got their own spin to put on things. Um, the problem is, is that we don't have any other way of diagnosing patients, so we do use criteria. We don't have a biological marker, we don't have an anatomical marker, but of course that's where research is going to lead us. Um, you probably all are aware of some of the controversy around this illness, uh, pitting health professionals against activists, and uh, fortunately, um, that seems to be coming to a, I can't say close, but it seems uh, to a more um, a viable way of working together. And we're going to have to work together if we're going to get money to do the research that Stephen talks about. And we're going to have to have a truth and reconciliation. And we are going to have to remain united because if not, we are not going to get what we need to continue the proper science needed for this illness. Thank you. <laughs>